Greetings, and bienvenue, mine crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. Some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. It's my understanding that paramedics see some seriously screwed up stuff on a regular basis. Please share any creepy, cringing, morose, depressing, and dehumanizing stories you have heard or been a part of. My dad used to be a paramedic, and now runs a university program training them. I once asked him what the funniest thing that he saw on the job was. He said it was this case where a couple got into a fight, and the wife took a knife and slammed it into the back of his head, embedding it in his skull, but not reaching the brain. The funny part was everyone's reaction to this guy with a giant knife sticking out of the back of his head, and how they didn't know what to do with him because they couldn't lay him on the trolley slash table easily. He survived, and they were sent the knife in the mail. Paramedics around here see jack shit on a regular basis. I've completed 600 hours of internship and have been too burnt out to want to finish certification. Omaha and Council Bluffs. For some reason, our terrible program director is too lazy to complete the contract with the Greater Omaha Fire Department. Council Bluff's call volume is hit and miss, but has way too many called to homeless on the sidewalk runs. West O is too low volume to be good for students. I'll dump some of what I have seen. I don't know that any of it is extremely X. One of my most memorable calls was just outside of city limits mid-afternoon. We pull up on the scene at a farmhouse. Immediately in front of us is a tractor log chained to a downed tree approximately the size of the six-story house I rent. The only patient is a 60-year-old woman laying underneath the trunk which somehow managed to suspend itself two or three feet at her location. Her injuries included facial lacerations and most notably her right ankle was nearly amputated. Her foot was intact in her shoe, however tibia and fibula were clearly visible. The shoe was tethered to her by intact tendons. There's not a great deal you do as a medic versus a basic for this type of PT splint, tourniquet, medroot IV, transport, pain management, monitor. I'm not trying to list these in the correct order. So if you're an internet super medic, I don't give a F. One of the medications we push for patients with unexplained tachycardia, too fast heart rate, is adenosine. Infrequently, this medication will correct a patient's rhythm, but it is generally used as a diagnostic medication. It allows us to see for a few seconds on the cardiac monitor what the patient's underlying rhythm is. The little cardiac beep waves you know from movies are very useful as to a skilled eye. The waves give a three-dimensional representation of the activity of the heart. Back to the adenosine, though. What's impressive about this medication is it is essentially a fluid cardioversion, shock. When administering, you push and flush with saline into the IV about as fast as possible without blowing the IV vein. Once in, this medication stops the patient's heart. The half-life of this med is seconds, so it's done once it starts. A case that my teachers love talking about. Guy comes to the hospital with strange, diffuse abdominal pain, and his urine is blue. The doctors examine him and see weird blue spots on his abdomen. They take him to the scan and see hydroeric levels in his abdomen. The blood tests don't show anything in particular, which is very strange. So many specialists meet the guy. Everybody tries to find out what's wrong with him. Eventually, the dermatologist suggested they take a biopsy of the blue spots. Turns out it was ink and air injected with a syringe in his abdomen. The guy denied doing it as much as he could and still denies it nowadays. The doctors classified it as a case of Munchausen. I know an anesthesiologist who was working for the emergencies one day. They were called by an old woman whose granddaughter was having a seizure. Don't know the exact cause. When they arrived there, it was a 10 years old girl, not breathing anymore, and they were too late. She was dead. While they were looking at the body and filling some papers, the grandmother ran out of the room. He ran after her and found her climbing out of the window from the sixth floor and grabbed her at the last moment before she jumped to end herself. Everyone tried to calm her down. She told them of her life story, got married and had a daughter, then her husband died from cancer, so she raised her daughter alone. Then she got married and had a daughter of her own, but she and her husband died in a car accident. So the grandmother was raising the little girl alone, and now she had nothing to live for anymore. Little boy comes to the emergency room with his mom. His arm is badly twisted, 
you can see right away that his ulna and radius are broken. So we call the orthopedics guy, the mom. Oh, I hope it's not too bad, because we're going skiing tomorrow for one week and... The orthopedics, huh, his arms really are broken. We'll have to put some screws in it and keep it for X weeks. The mom. But you don't understand. His father and I got a divorce recently, and he's trying to buy my son's affection with gifts and vacations, so I need to compensate. We're going to ski. The orthopedics. It's not about you. It's about your son. If we don't fix up his arm now, it might be deformed for the rest of his life, and he'll be handicapped forever. The mom. It's my son and I know what's best for him. Just make a bandage. So the orthopedist pretends he'll do what the mom wants and calls the judge. Don't know how it works in America, but in here you take the custody of the kid during an emergency if the parent won't cooperate. He fixed up his arm, but in the end the mom still wanted to take him skiing, so all we could do was beg the kid not to listen to his mom and take off the bandages and whole thing. Still more medical than paramedical, but a creepy story from when I was in digestive surgery. We still have no idea what happened. Middle-aged woman is admitted for abdominal pain in the right iliac fossa with a sudden start and then persisting for the last few months. Only antecedent, cholecystectomy last year. We take her to the scan and we have this clear image of a small metal thing in the right iliac fossa. We can clearly see it from different angles. It's outside of the intestines in the peritoneal cavity, so it can't be something that she's swallowed herself. I ask the head surgeon next to me if it's a remnant from her cholecystectomy that they've forgotten something inside. Even if it does not look like any surgical tool I've seen, he says no, that if it was the case, she would have felt pain ever since the operation or nothing at all. He doesn't know. So we decided to take her to the operating room, find the thing with radiography and take it out to see what it might be. I was so excited to find out, so I asked if I could assist, run to the operating room that day and find the woman asleep and the surgeon looking annoyed. There's nothing anymore on the images. It's like the metal thing just disappeared. We spent a while trying to find it back, but we couldn't see it anymore, and we had to wake up the woman and send her back home without doing anything. I don't know if she still has pain nowadays because I'm not working there anymore, but it's one of those cases where you never find out what the hell was going on. You can't have a metal object appearing and fading away just like this. I'm confused. The only rational explanation I could find would be a really weird and dangerous prank from a radiologist who doesn't mind risking his career. And even then it makes little sense. I'm not a paramedic, but I have a related story. I'm in the army and I was at a base called Forward Operating Base McHenry in Iraq in 2006 and 2007 which U.S. Americans share with some Iraqi army soldiers. One night, I was tasked to be on litter duty, which meant that if there was an ambulatory emergency, me and a few other guys had to help do some of the grunt work, like carrying wounded people to the aid station. It just so happened this particular night, an Iraqi army patrol hit an IED, and the casualty evacuated the wounded back to McHenry. The guy I had to help put on a litter and carry had a giant hole blown through the middle of his face. It's hard to describe, but he looked sort of like the predator. No lips, teeth exposed, no discernible mouth, no cheeks, no tongue, no nose, just a big bloody oozing hole. The worst part was that he was still alive. I could see his face whole, gasping for air. He grabbed my army combat uniform top and nearly ripped it off my body. I got so much of his face blood in me that I had to burn all the clothes I was wearing afterwards. Thank God I was already desensitized to gore, thanks to years of internet access. At a long-term ventilator unit, assigned potato in vegetative state, roommate is a youngish dude with a big divot in the side of his head always mouthing words to me but can't figure them out. Ask the nurse what happened. Electrical engineer in the army, married Korean, had a kid. She left him, he tried to blow his brains out. Mum keeps him alive. Realise the words he's trying to form are kill me. Badfields.jpg. Same place, a young woman, picture next to bed, was beautiful. Cards tacked on the wall, was dropped in hospital during a seizure. Now a vented vegetable. 
Nurses say she never gets visitors. Parents choose to keep her alive with a machine, but only send her cards. I'm a new nurse. Take care of a guy with metastatic liver cancer for six months. Approaching end of life. Has these long, coherent conversations with someone named Jerry. Family comes in that morning. Give them an update, tell them he's delirious and talking to someone named Jerry, but seems comfortable. Sisters exchange shocked looks. Ask them if something's wrong. Jerry was his brother. He took his life at 21. He was never the same afterwards. Expired that day. That reminds me of something my family experienced a few years ago. Great grandpa is very old and has Alzheimer's. Mom acts as his caretaker. He begins talking to thin air, always telling my mom about the little boy. The little boy plays peekaboo with him. The little boy rides his bike outside the window. The little boy likes watching cartoons with him. The little boy has a little gray cat that follows him around. My mom tries to gently ask if grandpa is talking about my brothers or even my dad or great uncles. He insists it's a little boy who lives nearby and comes to visit and keep him company. Obviously, little boy is not there and there are no little boys on our street other than my brothers. Grandma, great grandpa is her father, comes over for a visit. Oh, sweetie, come in here and say hi to Georgie. Grandma immediately walks right back out. Finally tells us Georgie was the first born son but died at age three back in the 40s. Shows us the one single small black and white photo of George. Literally only person left who had ever known George is great grandpa. He died a few weeks later, still talking to and playing with Georgie. Former volunteer FD in Midwest US here. Craziest call. Lived near a steep switchback hill. Until 10 years ago, the hill didn't have guardrails due to the rural budget. Very commonplace for MVAs, especially when icy and snowing. Tones drop on radio, 1050 on hill, roll fire department and EMS. When we arrived on scene, the car went off an embankment into a ditch. Not uncommon for MVAs here. Approach the car in the ravine. The inside of the car is literally coated in blood. Oh shit, dot, JPG. Older model Chevy Corsica had the motorized shoulder belt on the door frame. Driver door is bent and inoperable. Open passenger door. Driver was not wearing a manual lap belt. Driver somewhat seated and slid forward. Left hand still on wheel. Blood everywhere. Driver's severed head on floorboard in back seat. Full decapitation. Shoulder belt worked like a guillotine upon impact. Driver obviously quite dead, but eyes remain open, staring at the front of the cabin. I still see those blank staring eyes to this day. I'm not a paramedic. I'm a college student, but I've had some experience with hospitals and one in particular sticks out in my mind. My great grandfather was a preacher. Last December, he had a heart attack had a second heart attack in the hospital two days later. I went in to visit him. I am the oldest great-grandchild, so I was one of the first to see him. He is completely unconscious, as far as anybody knows. Only me, him, my great-grandma, and a nurse, who happens to be my aunt, in the room. I start praying out of nowhere because I feel like I should, even though I was feeling a bit irreligious at the time. His eyes open, he raises his hand, and he kicks his leg up the same way he kicked when he was preaching. I go home. He died two days later when of heart failure. I can't believe it has been almost a year since he died. Not many people can say that their great-grandpa was with them on their 18th birthday, and I really thought he would be there to see me graduate high school too. My 19th birthday has already passed now, and I'm almost halfway through my first university semester. Still, as sad as his death made me, I learned what faith really was on that night praying in that ICU room. I was an EMT briefly before giving up on getting into fire. I only got three stories. The patient was stabbed in the abdomen and ODing at the same time. He seems fine when we walk in, being stabbed aside. He gets up and lifts his shirt. Massive gash across the bottom of his stomach that looks like a smiley face. We get to work patching him up for transport. Drugs start wearing off. He starts freaking heart rate increasing and blood starts flowing out again. Best in mind, this happened in like 45 seconds. He goes from talking to us to talking to the ceiling. He mutters his last words, 
I'm ready, God, then goes out. Some lady had her entire face blown off, attempted self-termination with a magnum revolver. There's nothing we can do. She can't breathe and we can't secure an airway. There's nothing left. Medical direction basically tells us to let her die. I can't help but wonder if she could hear our conversation on the radio with them. She was fully conscious and sucking blood the whole time. Nice old lady in an auto accident. Dips hit firefighters forget spinal protection precautions. Her head is resting against the side window. Window partially rolled down. She's talking to us, saying she's okay. Fire guy opens the door. Her neck snaps and head hits the pavement. She's gone. Went from I'm okay to dead in the time it took to open a door. Got one here for you. Buddy of mine's dad is an EMT paramedic. When I was getting ready to go into school, he was sharing some stories with me and brought up one relayed to him by his teacher when he was going through school. Guy gets called out to a suburban household to find the garage open, and the homeowner is sitting on her front lawn. They ask what's up and she says she isn't calling about her. But the man in the garage, so they go into the garage and look around, don't find anybody. They go back out to ask her what she meant and she says look under the car. So of course they go back in and look under her SUV and lo and behold there's a man, or what's left of him at least. Apparently what had happened was she'd hit a pedestrian and didn't stop and said pedestrian got caught under her SUV and was dragged for an 18 mile drive at highway speeds with his back against the ground. Apparently he'd been ground in half, lengthwise. On a more lighthearted note, friend's dad is getting slammed with calls all night. Ten minutes before it's time to go home. Call comes in. Guy freaking out says he's oding on weed. No, you're fine. Adamant that he's oding needs to go to the hospital. Buddy's dad responds, get in the ambulance. Wav. Guy is freaking out. Won't settle. 16 gauge IV, here comes the pain. JPEG. Take him to the hospital, talk to the admitting nurse. And what gauge of needle? 16 gauge. What? Shrug. Gif. I only have one story, and that's because I live in Utah County, Utah, so it's not exciting. A lot of heroin overdoses, but one really stood out. Night shift, training and day to become life flight medic. One night, there was a call to an old homeless man that everyone in Orem knows who collapsed outside 7-Eleven. We were right by there and got on scene, and Reggie, homeless dude, was outside the flat, a guy giving him mouth to mouth, even though you aren't supposed to do that anymore. We got him strapped in and I was bagging him after putting a drip in. Looked like he had a heart attack. Suddenly his eyes opened before we pulled up and he pulled off the bag and says to me, My name, your mother sure did a great job with you, I'm so proud. I thought he was just delusional from the trauma. We hopped out back to grab the journey and turned around and he was gone. True story. We went to open the cab to see if he jumped up front and the passenger door was open. He had jumped up and fled. After an hour of searching, we found him dead on the roof. I was all creeped out. He was my real dad or shit, but my mom denied it up and down. A couple that I saved. I've worked in several nursing homes since 1997, so I've had plenty of run-ins with restless spirits. At this one nursing home, there were three different wings, north, east, and west. West wing was the heavy hall, mostly tube feeders and total care. East was the Medicare slash short-term rehab wing. Then there was North. North had a pretty eclectic mix of patients of differing levels of acuity. There was a short hall and a long hall. However, to the back of the North wing, there was a long hall that had about 10 private rooms, a day room on one end and a small dining room on the other end. The residents back in this hall, called 400 Hall, were all ambulatory and even a few wanderers. Now I generally worked from 3 to 11, but on this particular night, the 11 to 7 girl was sick, so I was asked to stay. As I was off the next night, I agreed. Since I was working a double, I was given the assignment on 400 Hall. It was an easy assignment as most of the residents were continent and the few that weren't were really lightweight. Anyhow, I was sitting in the dining room with the lights off, charting by the dimmed hall lights when I caught something out of the corner of my eye moving down the hall. Thinking it was one of my wanderers, I looked up and saw what to this day I still believe was a toddler on a tricycle. Let me tell you now, I lost it. The handbook went flying and I skittered up the short hallway to the nurse's station. 
I relayed my story to the charge nurse, and she just sort of chuckled at my expression and explained that one of the residents that had passed away years ago had a grandson that was killed by the back tires of her car. He was in the driveway, and she didn't see him and backed right over him. The night the lady died, she was calling out, Tyler, oh my baby Tyler, Nana's coming. Then she passed. Everyone has come to the conclusion that the toddler on the tricycle still haunts that hall, looking for his grandma. Either way, I never worked another 11 to 7 in the 400 hall. I work in a 9-bed cardiac care unit that we night shift nurses swear is haunted. I personally have seen figures standing in doorways late at night. Blinds in patients' windows go up by themselves. Call bells come on when the room is unoccupied. One night, another nurse and myself were giving a bath when the TV started flipping through all the channels. The remote for the TV was behind her on a stand. Another time, she was giving a bath by herself to a TV, sedated and restrained patient. She was down on her haunches, tying his restraint when she felt someone or something run their fingers through her hair. The patient was on 100 microgram by kilogram of Deprevin, so it was not him, and there was not anyone with her in the room. The scariest one is one night we admitted a patient into room 9. After we had gotten her into bed, she looked at the wall in front of her and asked what was on the wall. We looked and there was bright red blood running down the wall. Needless to say, we checked ourselves. The patient and the ER personnel had not left the floor, and no one had a fresh cut or open area on them. Well, the week before a young lady had died in that room. She came into the hospital complaining of abdomen pain. She ended up having an upper endo and perfed something. She had projectile vomited blood all over that wall and floor. It was horrible. The nurses on that night said it looked like a slaughterhouse. I still get chills just thinking about it. Years ago, I worked in a city as a paid EMT. Our crew would consist of two EMTs or one paramedic and one EMT. I did 12-hour shifts, usually 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. or 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Sometimes, the nights felt very long, especially if we were not too busy. Ambulance crews would stage throughout the city to make it easier and faster to get to emergency calls. On occasion, crews would meet up in the middle of the night just to pass time and hang out. My partner and I met up with two other crews one night. It was about 2.30 in the morning, and the city was fairly quiet. We stood out in the parking lot at one of the three hospitals that we would stage at. After some time, we were approached by a gentleman who appeared to be in his mid 60 cess. He wore a light jacket over his dress shirt and a tie. His hair was clean cut and white. This man was not very tall, maybe a couple inches taller than me. He didn't talk, just smiled and made an acknowledging gesture to both my partner and I, then walked away. A couple minutes later, I told my partner I needed to use the restroom and I would go into the Killington building because it was an easier access both in and out. Inside, I found that the bathroom was occupied, so I waited in the front lobby with a security guard who was taking a break. After a couple minutes of idle chat, he informed me that the bathroom was free. I stood and turned to walk away and noticed a portrait on the wall behind me. It was the gentleman from the parking lot. The kindly looking man was now looking down at me from the wall. I told the security guard how I had just seen the old man outside and that it was an odd experience because he never said a word to us, then just walked away. The security guard said that I could not have seen this man tonight, but I argued the fact and he insisted that it was impossible because Mr. Killington had passed away two years earlier. I told the guard that I knew what I saw and had five other people who saw this man at the same time. I noticed this man had turned a milky gray in color and proceeded to tell me he had heard stories about Mr. Killington visited his building on several occasions, having been seen in the halls on the upper floors. Before this, 
the security guard never believed the stories. This one ain't real scary, but spooked and confused the hell out of me. BEMT. Get a call for a patient with chest pain at around 10 p.m. Arrive on scene. The address we were called to looks really suspicious. Run down, all lights off, lawn not mowed properly, can't see into the house at all. Partner and I look at each other feeling uneasy. Radio dispatch to make sure it's the right address. Dispatch confirms. All right then, head over to the house, knock on the door with partner on the other side. Old man slowly opens the door and invites us in. Doesn't bother turning on the lights. Ask him to keep the door open. See a faint glowing upstairs. Tells us his wife is upstairs. Go up the stairs and find his wife sitting in bed, not responding to verbal stimulus. Only light in the room is coming from the television. Ask him if it's all right to turn on a light. You can't do that. He doesn't like it. He. Is there someone else besides the four of us in this house, sir? No, just us right now can't comprehend what he's trying to tell me. Insist on turning the lights on so we can properly assess his wife. He starts getting aggressive. The lights will not go on in this household. All right, whatever, I'll use the flashlight I brought. Ask him about his wife's medical history, etc. Partner has me escort him downstairs because the room is pretty small and he seems to be jittery and panicking for no apparent reason. Get downstairs, tells me he's going to go out back to relax. All right, no worries. Try to stick around in case your wife starts responding again. Hear this dude slam the back door and sprint through the grass. What the hell? He's an old man. How could he be running like that? Open the back door to check if he's still possibly there. Nope. Go back upstairs. Let's call him Joe. Joe just bolted out of here. I mean, he sprinted away out the back. We need to get out of here ASAP. You done with vitals and everything. Partner confirms. The patient needs transport. Notify dispatch the scene may no longer be safe. Load the patient onto a stair chair and move downstairs. Notice the front door is closed when it had clearly been left open upon my request. No way. Partner asked me if I closed it while I was down here. Nope. Maybe it was the wind or something. Yeah, that must be it. Keep wondering why and how the hell did that old man would bolt out of the house like that get patient to the ambulance. En route to the hospital, the patient's level of consciousness improves after interventions. Tell her that husband bolted out of the house. MFW, she tells me she doesn't have a husband. Ask her how that's possible if he knew her medical history. He had given us completely incorrect information. Partner and I just look at each other with raised eyebrows and wide eyes. Bring it up after the patient's in the hospital. Partner tells me to never bring it up again. Confesses he got spooked when the old man said, no, just us right now. To this day, I wonder how the hell he bolted through the back so quickly. And who he was. Why the hell he didn't want the lights on. Who he was. I am an EMT in Santa Clara County, 45 miles south of San Francisco. One night, we got a call about a kid choking. We got to the house and the babysitter was on the phone with the parents and the kid was upstairs in his room. We went up to check on the kid in his room and everything was fine, but we decided to take him in to have him checked over. So we went to bring up the cot and in the upstairs hallway there's this clown statue that we can't get the cot around. I am standing with my back to the clown statue as my partner went downstairs to see if we could move it. She was still on the phone with the parents and asked them if it's okay to move the clown statue. The reply from the parent was, we don't have a clown statue. Note, I don't hear this as I am standing with the cot with my back to the clown statue. My partner looks up at me and casually says, can you come down here for a sec? We have to get this kit ready and I need help lifting it. He told me the parents said they didn't have a clown statue and to get the police now. He then told the babysitter, get the rest of the kids and get out of the house now. They got everyone out of the house and the cops showed up to find out that this clown statue was a known mental patient that had recently been released from hospital. He had his arms crossed with two ice picks hidden under his arms. He could have easily killed me. I was standing inches away from him with my back to him. Nobody knows how he got inside the home or how long he was standing up there not moving. Just thinking about this now gives me the creeps. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes. Midnight Central Time.
Remember to check the Odyssey and Rumble pages for separate archives of previous broadcasts.